Hi everyone and welcome to this talk about motion capture. My name is Chloe Bonnet, I'm a lead senior cinematic animator at CA and I'm going to talk to you about how we use motion capture to tell stories in the Total War team. Quick little thing about myself, uh, I have worked at CA since 2014, I joined the company as an intern and got to work on loads of different projects, nine games in total, all in the uh, Total War franchise from the Tortoise of Mars DLC for Rome 2 up to the last trailer that we released for Warhammer 3, which is Dawn of Grand Cathay. Um, I got to contribute to all those games in my time at CA, really worked on every single cutscenes and trailers for Attila, as well as for Warhammer, Warhammer 2, uh, Thrones of Britannia, Three Kingdoms, that was an exciting game to work on because I had no idea about Chinese history and now I really, really like it. Uh, did a humble contribution to Troy and to Arena, and I got to be a lead cinematic animator for the trailers that we released so far for Warhammer 3, which is a very awesome accomplishment in my career, and I'm very happy that it got received so well by uh, everybody out there. So let's move on to uh, how do we use motion capture to tell stories. So we've got, we're going to go through four different big steps that we have to go through um, to do that properly. So uh, plan, uh, shoot, edit, and enhance. So let's just go to part one, shall we? <laughs> um, part one is planning. So you need to plan for your motion capture. You can't go just to motion capture and then just do your thing while you're there. So you first need a detailed script. So the detailed script is usually provided by the cinematic artist in charge of the asset, but the cinematic artists also work with uh, the devs and run to make sure that the story that we are going to tell is in line with the law and what the marketing requirements are for a trailer. Once this is done, then we get as well a budget, a budget that's agreed with production. So how many uh, staff days are we going to be able to spend on such project and how much can we afford to do within that, those time frames, both for cinematic artists and animators. So we go through an estimation um, process, which is try to gauge as much as possible how things are going to be for from the script and try and find uh, a good idea of how long things going, will take and is that going to be fitting within budget if that doesn't fit we can have a discussion maybe to extend the budget make it a bit bigger or we just need to find creative solutions to make it fit within budget and still have a very exciting story to tell uh, something that we use and that's very practical for that is the storyboard so uh, storyboard when we've got enough pre-production time which was the case for uh, so far all the trailers for Warhammer 3 uh, we got to do some very detailed storyboard and uh, give a proper idea of what kind of story we wanted to tell um, and then once we've got the storyboard finished and uh, we are happy with it then we put it with uh, within a video that's called an animatic uh, the animatic is just a compilation of all storyboard thumbnails back to back with the music and maybe voiceover or subtitles to give an idea of what the rhythm of the trailer will be and if we don't have time for a storyboard or we can do that alongside storyboard we can do a repomatic so a repomatic is a combination of images shots and audio from assets that are pre-existing so that could be films that could be adverts that could be past trailers and in our case most of the time it's us filming ourselves as a reference to give an idea of what the story will be Let's have a look at some behind the scenes and some cool uh, repomatic we've done in the past. But this city will never be safe. Not whilst he is still out there. We just warm it up! A storm comes. All sons are born in the shadow of their fathers. But the day will always come when they must stand alone and are faced with a choice. 
Do they follow the path put before them? Or take a different road? She's just an outlaw. So that was some pretty cool behind the scenes that we use. So we tend to do that pretty much for all trailers. Uh, it's a really quick and effective way to tell the story uh, that we want to propose to uh, devs and brand so everybody's on board. And hopefully from there we get a sign off. So that means. Hmm. Sorry, everybody is uh, on board for the trailer to be uh, made. So to prepare the shoot, I like to think of it like a play. So you need different stakeholders. You really need different people to be able to do your shoot properly and for it to go well. First and foremost, you need your motion capture technicians. So they are the guys at the motion capture studio who maintain the cameras, maintain the tech there to record the, the motion capture. They will be here to make sure that the shoot goes well and smoothly, that nothing technically arises uh, and that the mocap and the data comes back to us as clean and nice as possible for us to work from. Then we need the actors. So uh, most of the time for the trailers, we are the ones, i.e. the cinematics team, jumping into the, the suit and then acting out what we need for uh, telling our stories. Uh, if we need something that requires, you know, um, fighting and combat, usually we call for the help of professional actors and for bigger pieces as well. Then we need directors. So I put two different directors in there and you're going to understand why. The principal cinematic artist who has written the script and is the director for the trailer or the cutscene needs to be there to keep an eye on how the actions unfold, what the acting is like, if the performance goes well with the story they want to tell. And the principal cinematic animator is here to keep an eye out on uh, if the models and the, I mean, if the motion goes with the models that we have and if there's not some kind of uh, imperfections that go uh, within the uh, uh, motion capture that might be detrimental in the future. Basically, we're trying to find issues at that point. Then we need props, because if your character needs to carry a big, very heavy shield and sword, we need them to be ready. Usually the motion capture technicians will be the ones preparing them, putting markers on them so we can record their motion. We need a set. So if your character, same thing, needs to go upstairs or climb a ladder or sit on a bench or something like that, we'll need to figure out what the set is so the props can be ready for us to use during the motion capture shoot. And then finally, something that's really important to me and to us at CA is to have our costumes ready. So what I mean by costume is that we want to be able to play the motion capture real time while we record it with the models of the character playing on the computer at the same time so we get a visual of what the motion is on those characters. Plus it's easier to um, gauge if the motion is going to be nice and it's going to be fitting for the character if you've got the model and it's not just a skeleton of your actor moving on the screen. So here are some examples. So yeah, you see that, you know, someone acting for Orion won't act, it, act the same for the Fae Enchantress and that's very important. Then once this is all ready and you are going to head to your motion capture shoot, then part two can start the shoot. So during the shoot, you need to, make, to pay attention to your performance and your acting. You need to give precise and insightful direction to your actors, especially if they're not professional. That means that instead of saying to someone, act angry, uh, <laughs> there's so many different types of being angry, right? So you need to give your actor some kind of detail about how angry they are. Are they angry because uh, they got lost a family member? Are they angry because someone, don't know, pierced the tires of their car? Are they angry because they are late? 
uh, etc. So those uh, ways of being angry, if you give more detail, then your actor will be more likely to be able to identify with it and channel that kind of anger that they might have felt at some point in their life to towards the performance for the character. Keep in mind what the character's story is. So is the character, you know, old? Has it gone through a lot? Uh, is it a magical being? Is it a character that's very detached and uh, regal and things like that? So you need to be able to keep that in mind so you can direct your actors properly. Then keep an eye on how long actions take. So it's pretty funny because we have times where we think an action is going to take 10 seconds and then we record it and it lasts for 30. So uh, we need to be able to keep an eye on how long things take to do and then maybe speed up or slow down actions so it fits the pacing of your story. Then you need to look out for posture and stance. So it's something that especially happens when you've got inexperienced actors. Um, they are fidgeting a lot and it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing, but it's just something that you need to look out for because you don't want it to make its way into the motion capture. So something like, you know, wiggling your torso or wiggling your knees or tapping them together, doing sm very small waist shifts and very small steps all the time. It just breaks the stability of your character and will be much harder to delete later on than it is to tell your actor, please stand still at that point. And then how does the performance look like on your character? So this example right there is pretty interesting. So the character on the left is a, an Empire State Troop from Warhammer 1. And when he lifts his arm up with uh, his sword or axe or whatever, you can see that his shoulder is going up and his clavicle and shoulder are slightly touching the face. So that's something that for this character, the motion can function, even though we're going to have to edit it quite a lot. Then Marcus Fulfart on the right of the picture, he's got some fur on his shoulders. So we can see that already the motion might not be fitting because this area being so squished like this might create problems uh, in your shape and in your silhouette. And then finally, Carl Franz in the middle, <laughs> you can see that his shoulder pad is so massive that it actually goes through his arm and through his head. So because his costume doesn't allow for such motion, it's very important to have that kind of visual because your actor doesn't only wear their Lycra suits with the markers on, but not the big shoulder pads, etc. So um, yeah, it's something to look out for. And in that very case, this motion was indeed recorded for Carl Franz and we had to do a lot of fixing afterwards. And that came through the editing and enhancing process that followed. Right, part three, edit. <clears throat> so to edit the motion capture, we use Motion Builder. Um, so let's just go straight into it, shall we? Our favorite tool to use to edit the mocap in the first stages is Motion Builder. This is because Motion Builder is made to handle motion capture. So it doesn't get overwhelmed with curves, nor the amount of keys that are on there. You can really edit your mocap very quickly. And as well, you can see all of your different takes uh, in the same file, which is pretty cool. So here is a scene of Luther Harkin from the Vampire Coast trailer. So this is the last stage of the digging scene that he's doing, where he digs in the sand to find the treasure, the trinket that he's been looking for for many, many years. So at that point, we gave some feedback and some direction to Sam, our actor at the time, uh, to um, convey that at that point, Harkin can't contain his excitement anymore. He's not digging with a shovel, he's digging with his hands. He's so close to get to find his final treasure that like really, he can't, he can't just be behaved anymore. So the first direction that we gave him was dig rapidly, find the trinket and then have a relieved beat in your uh, motion, like kind of a finally moment. Here's the take. Once this recorded, we were like pretty happy with that take, but we were thinking maybe there's a few corrections we could add to make it even better. So 
Let's keep the dig rapidly. Maybe use both hands to dig in places and then just one hand at a time to dig. That would be a nice in, to break down a little bit the motion and get it more interesting. Then try to add some twitchings because um, Harkin's got multiple personalities fighting within himself. It'd be great to have some twitching as he comes up and then have a little bit more tension and excitement when he raises the trinket in the air because in this take, even though it was nice, um, we need to still see a little bit of excitement from him. Like he's finally found his beloved trinket that he's been searching for. Here's take two. Take two was pretty nice, but at that point in the process, we were like, okay, this is going to be shot from the back. So that twitching moment here, when he raises, that's not going to read very well. And it might become more troublesome and uh, result in things having to be edited too heavily and uh, be cropped and reanimated. So we thought, let's record a third take when we maintain the way that you dig with the hands, because the, the hands were actually doing some really nice motion in there and contain the excitement for a beat just before you raise the trinket in the air and the final step of the uh, alim. That one felt pretty nice and we were very happy with the, how that turned out. So we decided to keep this take and work from this one. So let's go to the editing phase. I'm going to do a duplicate of uh, the take that I like. So that's React 3. I'm going to click on there, take 2, copy the data from the current take to the new take. Yes. So now we've got the take 3 here, the original one that's maintained, and we can work on the take, on the copy of that take. We're going to use story mode. So I've already created a character track in here for uh, the character Sam, which is our actor. Then I'm going to insert the current take. Here we go. Now I can enable story mode. So here, whatever I do in here, I'll have to bake back onto the take so I can uh, use it. So the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the getting into place from typos, etc., from the take. The anime is going to start from here roughly, so I'm just going to use the razor, then delete that part. So now he is static at the start, and then here I go towards the end, and same thing. I'm going to stop right there before he goes back to the pose. So razor, and then cut, and that's it. Nice, cool. So now, now that we've got this, the take is, you know, rid of all the T pose bits and bobs uh, in there. I can look at the, the, the take length here. So we've uh, already cropped uh, quite a substantial amount of data from there. So that's pretty good. Sometimes what we like to do is double click on the take here and speed up the motion by uh, 10%. So this is to get your motion to be a bit more snappy, especially when, when it comes to biped, walking, uh, all that jazz. It's pretty cool to just add a little bit of speed on there because the mocap tends to be slightly underwhelming sometimes. So this is an option that we like to use. Uh, you don't have to do it systematically and all the time, but in that case, uh, we used it because then it brings you a little bit more craziness and snappiness in those areas there. So it's not a massive difference, but it makes it a bit better. Cool, once this is done, we can uh, take your, the take, reduce it to the amount of uh, frames that we got it to, so two, 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 three, done. So the take is the length of our take here. Then I'm going to press on this little eye icon there. And I'm going to make sure that the character is at zero, zero in the world for clean scene sake. And that is facing positive Z as well, which is already the case here. Um, some takes you might have been recording 
recording them from you know from afar and the character is not at zero zero and rotated away or like facing another way so it's always good to just go in and put your character at zero zero in the world so the scene is all clean then if i go out of story mode i'll see the take as it was before with the typos yeah so i want to apply what i did in story mode into the scene so to do that i right click and I plot all scene to a current take. This is going to bake it. So now we are overwriting the scene, the take here, with what was in story mode. And here we are. We've got a cleaner scene to work from. So that was pretty simple in terms of editing, but this is pretty much, I mean, maybe 80% or 90% of the time, that's how much editing we do on the takes, apart from some filtering that can happen within Motion Builder or within Maya, so that depends on animators' uh, preferences. Now, sometimes if the motion is not quite right and if we feel like maybe one take contains something that's nice and then one take contains something that's nice but they're not both together, then we can do some more advanced editing into Motion Builder. So let's have a look at that. In the same scene in Motion Builder, we can have a look at some more advanced editing uh, tools that we've got. The main one we like to use again is the story mode. So let's say um, in this case we like the way that Harkon digs in the first take which is one that we didn't use pre previously but then we don't really like the way he comes up and then the way he lifts the trinket into the air yeah yeah we can use story mode to blend multiple takes together and then create an entirely new one so for that case i want the start of take one so let's go to story mode insert current take then i'm going to isolate the part that i like with the razor tool razor delete this then i want him to be different from that point on so i'm just going to cut that get rid of the rest so here we are that's our first part that we want to use Now we said we want to use the part, the second part of the second take here. So I go out of story mode, look at what I want. So let's say I want the moment where he's going to be twitching there. So here. Let's have a look. Let's go back to story mode. So we've got the first take here, that's here. And then we're going to insert the current take. Here we go. So that's the new one, that's take two. And we just insert it in story mode and we want to use the part from when he reaches down razor delete that part and then we want him until he lifts the trinket into the air there we go so now in story mode we can actually blend those two takes together so that's take one and then take two so take one goes up to the point where he goes up and then down, and that's take two. So if we blend those two takes together like so, you can see the blend is going to affect the feet. So that's something that we'll have to fix up later on. Or we can choose to select the eye icon and then we can match the position. So between the two takes, see, we've got the skeleton of the second take here, and then the skeleton of the first take here. So we can see that the feet are slightly different. You can do it manually if you like, you know, for a take like so. Find, find a middle ground that would be easier to, ed to edit. There, the sliding is not as big anymore. Or you can use some of the matching tools there. Usually the, we like using the hips. Uh, but you can choose to match with the, the feet or the hand or the head, whatever you think you need to will look better with your blending. There you go. So if we really look at what we're going to use for the shot, for example, we're only barely going to use the top of the body because the rest, the feet, we won't see. So there you go. The, the, the blending is pretty much seamless at that point. Great, cool. And let's say that the final moment where he twitches and then lifts here, we're not fans of. Okay, 
as well, when you crop something, you can always extend it back and you still have your take on there, which is really practical. So this whole part I don't like, and I prefer take three. So let's have a look at take three. Take three is here, and it goes like this up, which is, you know, in that case, something that you, I want to, to keep it. So same thing, insert current take. That's my third take. I'm going to bring the start of the node here to the moment that I want. Insert mode, that's better. There we go. So that he's regrouped here. And then he's going to go up and punch through. Cool. So now let's find the perfect point for him to blend. It's going to be in that part here, yeah? And then he stops. So let's crop that. And then bring this one here. And now we want to blend them together as well. Here we go. That's pretty cool. Uh, we could have him go higher, not pose there. So the, the arm rays happen here. So let's just crop that a little bit more and blend them again. Hmm. A bit slow. See here you can see the the blend. That's not as nice as it could be. Let's just blend that back. Here we go. Those are the three takes. Yeah, so we've quickly just put together three the three different takes with some blending that the animators will have to fix up later, but that's an option you can have. Here you go. As well, you can use the um, this tool here to speed up things. So that's the same thing as double clicking and then cranking up the speed. Or you can just get that tool and then just compress. And you can see that the time here happens to change. So that's going to be played times 1.17, etc. So that will be played faster, which is something we can actually have a look at. So let's say that we want <coughs> A part of the digging to be a bit a bit slower let's say you know i want that part to be slower so let's isolate it use the razor tool then let's say that part from there i want to be slower let's make some room stretch that one out with that tool again here so it's playing at half the speed Here it's playing very slowly, and then it goes back to its original timing. And here we are, we've got some a bit more advanced editing, same thing, you need to create a new take. Uh, let's not copy this one, we'll finish at 2671, 2671, that's the length of our take. We can bake all of this, plot holes into current take plot and now when we're out of story mode this new animation is available to us and nothing prevents you from going into story mode disabling this track creating a new character animation track select your character so that sam still insert the current take yes and this is what you just baked so this is your previous version and that's the same thing but baked together and then this one you can you know edit again so let's say i want it to be at zero zero like i did previously there we are then he's facing positive z which is correct and then we can add uh, we can crank up the speed as well in there 1.1 there we go it's going to be a bit faster and that's a result Right, so editing. The editing is a pretty fun uh, part because you can really put things together quite quickly, edit them, make things faster, sh um, um, slower, uh, crop bits, re-bend, re stitch things together. 
um, yeah, it's really, really a creative process and it's actually a, a part that I really enjoy doing because, yeah, I mean, I get to play around with the different takes and uh, how the characters will look and what the base will be for uh, the next stage will be, which will be the enhancement stage. So to enhance motion capture, um, we've got different workflows depending on the needs that we need uh, to, to hit. So, for example, I'm going to show you three different scenes. There's going to be one for populating, so that means for background characters, uh, secondary characters, um, for crowds, etc., which just involves some basic cleanup and enhancement in the first stage. And then depending on if we see them up close or not, then we can uh, leave them in that stage or just move them onto like a slightly more advanced uh, enhancement uh, phase. Then we've got the acting characters. They definitely need advanced enhancement and cleanup, just so they are really nice and, and clean, and we can't see, you know, any sort of uh, motion capture imperfection in there. Um, we enhance the performance as well. Sometimes we need to adjust the acting because it's not quite right in motion capture, or the direction has changed. So, so that's when we do enhance the motion capture as well. Uh, and as well, we can add some lip sync and everything that's secondary motion. So you know, hair motion. Cloak, uh, cloak, you know, cape, uh, loincloth, or all, all that jazz that can be floaty and nice to look at. All of that will be done in the enhancements uh, phase. And then finally, I'll show you an even more complex scene with multiple characters interacting. So that's the same thing. The motion capture will only get you so far in terms of uh, fidelity and motion. So you will see that it does require a lot of uh, cleanup a lot of uh, performance enhancements as well and the polishing of the interaction and the contact between the characters but first let's just move on and see how we go about editing a basic character for background use or populating use this is an animation that we'll be using to populate shots and for uh, crowds and background what we want to look out for in this kind of animation is the posture, the feet animation, the contact especially. We can see that the feet are clipping through the ground, sliding a little bit. So this is something we'll have to uh, correct. And then we'll want to enhance the motion. Let's have a look at the posture. So what we want to do is select the controllers we want to adjust. In my case, I like to select every single controller of the spine, including neck and head, as well as the hips and create an animation layer that I'm going to call Posture. Right, when this is created, then we can select uh, our controller in there, set a key on the first frame, and then have a look at what we can do to improve the posture. So here we go, we've got the hips a little bit too uh, bent back, then the spine is a little bit like this, and then I don't want him to be that hunched over, so I'm just correcting his posture. Nice. And then a little bit on the neck and head right now, just so it's a bit more engaged. Here we go. Nice. Great. So we've got our posture fixed right now, or adjusted at least. Cool. Once this is done, then we can have a look at the feet. So we can see there's a lot of keys on every single controller. Uh, if we go to the base animation layer, every every controller will have keys on every single frame. We can use filters to get the data to be a bit less dense, but I would refrain from using filters on the feet just yet, because those are the ones that we're going to want to clean up. And if you clean up the keys a little bit too much, you might end up with something floaty that lacks a, a bit of uh, definition in terms of contacts. So let's have a look at the filters we can use. The filters that we like to use at CA are the Red9 tools. They're very good animation tools. And the one we are uh, interested in is the interactive curve filter right there. So let's just make sure that we are on the animation layer. I'm going to select everyone apart from the feet, the full vector and the toes. Make sure I select everyone in here and then snap to frame to make sure that keys don't get moved in between frames and then we can resample our curves here we go three is a bit much let's just go two now we've got keys every two frames that will make your animation a little bit smoother get rid of some of the jitter that might be on the spine it won't be removing it completely 
but at least it will be a bit more spread out and not as uh, dense. Cool. Now we've got the feet. So the feet, let's have a look at the keys now. The Y. The Y is not too bad, but you can see in that case, especially here, that the Y is going up and down a bit. Let's go there. Yeah, here you go. So those are the things that you're going to have to want to edit by hand. Uh, in the first instance, I would not go in and use any of your foot bank and foot roll functions in your rig just yet, because let's just remind ourselves that this is a background character. So it does, it might not need that much cleanup to look great from afar. Like already from here, it's kind of okay, but we want it to be clean. So what we want to do is go to base animation layer and then start having a look at those curves, the Y, the X, if there's a bit of side to side motion, it's not too bad right now. And then on the rotations as well. Once this is done, we can move on to the next stage. Here we go. So feet clean up. This is another weave that I've got where the feet are a bit cleaner. Basically, this is a combination of work of doing what I said earlier, clean up the Y, make the curves a bit more clean. Same for the X, the rotation as well has been edited. So it's a bit cleaner and a bit flatter on the contacts, just so the feet look nicer. Same goes from this one. Right. Now you can notice that I've switched as well in this file, the arm into IK. This is just for personal preference in there, just to enhance a little bit the motion that the character's doing with his arm. We still have our posture layer here, and then the arms are just doing slightly different motion. And then finally, we can have even more uh, enhancement to the motion capture. So here we go, we've added another layer. So the character has got a little bit more delay. So it gives a little bit of uh, weight to the torch. And really, that's it. This animation that could have taken days and days to do by hand, took a few hours to clean up. That allows for us to move on to more bespoke storytelling animations. Yeah, so that's a very important part of uh, why we use motion capture at CA and why we use it to uh, tell stories is because we've got so many massive scale scenes where loads of characters are moving at the same time, troops walking by, um, you know, secondary motion um, everywhere in the screen, you know, like people preparing for the cafe trailer. Uh, the Dawn of Grand Cafe trailer, like we had all that preparation scene uh, that we had thankfully loads of motion capture that we could use just so we could populate those shots and make the city look busy. If we have had to do everything by hand and just focus for the, on that scene, then none of the rest of the trailer would have had, uh, um, you know, animation provided. So, you know, if you look at it, you know, there's the Big Dragon, Kairos Fate Weaver, which got, which is like, you know, a massive bird being with two heads. Uh, yeah, all those animals would have been, you know, maybe uh, not done or maybe the entire introduction scene wouldn't have been able to be done because of the amount of uh, characters that we wanted to show uh, being busy preparing for war. So this is a very important part of the process. It's quite straightforward and usually pretty simple to go through but they are key to our scenes looking as exciting as, as they are. So now let's just move on to an acting character. So this is Malus uh, Darkblade from the Shadow and the Blade trailer that we did a couple of years ago now. Um, so this is using some motion capture that we uh, recorded. So the top left picture is the raw motion capture from uh, the shoot. And then we had to enhance it and add the acting because in that very case, we didn't have the audio uh, before the motion capture shoot. So we had to do something quite vanilla to start with so we could add animation on top. So let's have a look at how the process goes for this. This is the first scene I'm going to show you and that's the raw data from uh, motion capture. So this is straight out of motion builder when we cut out the typos and then uh, got the body ready with a few filters, etc. 
So here is what Malice looks like straight from mocap. As for the shot. So we can see that his posture could be much better. Once again, we've got the spine that we could adjust in terms of posture. We've got the clavicles that are really inwards as well. And we've got the left arm, which is in camera, a bit too regrouped. What we're going to do in the first time is add some corrective layers like we did for the previous example. So for example, I'm going to put some uh, the clavicles on a different layer so we can fix them. We could actually just zero them. Here you go. So just adjust the position. Okay, there. And there. And then the arm, of course, that needs to be added to this layer as well. Just select the controllers and key that there. So this is the first thing I would do usually. It's correct the posture. So you can create multiple layers depending on the areas of the body that you want to uh, focus on. So I would say gloves and uh, right arm. And then this one would be neck, head, etc. Once you're happy with your pose and it looks a bit nicer, you can go on and do your second uh, pass. So this is with the corrective layers on already. So you can see that the motion capture under I have not touched yet. It's really just the same one, but the main difference is that I've got a head and neck posture fix here. I've got clavicles, so this one for now, and then the left arm. That's a bit better in terms of uh, silhouette in the camera. So at that point, I've not applied any kind of filters just yet because I need to see what the motion feels like in camera. Then I move on to this, the next uh, pass that I do, which is lip sync, because you can see there's some audio there. So first pass of lip sync and then first pass of body as well uh, to the lip sync. So the main difference in this scene is that uh, chatting with the team and the other uh, directors on the project, we felt like the head turn was not really working and doing it for us. So we decided to remove it. So now you can see that the curves will have some keys removed in here. This is because I wanted to clean it up, remove it completely so I could create a new one on top. Um, if the motion was more important on the body as a whole, if Malus was doing something more invested with his um, torso, then I would have cleaned up exactly the same keys as the ones on the head, just so no jitter can come through. And same, I would select the base, uh, the root as well. Just so those controllers and those keys here wouldn't create jitter and noise. But because the character is so static, I left them as is. And also created some cool pose for the face. So the face was completely done by hand. Now at that point, talking about the spine and the head, I actually thought it would be a good time to do some filtering of the of the keys. So if I go to my next version, here we are, and I select my spine, you can see that the base animation layer has had some cleanup on it. This is one, two, three, it's gonna be every, every five frames has a key, and then the rest has no key, just so I get completely rid of the motion. Um, just so I get rid of any kind of jitter or noise on the, on the spine. At that point as well, we decided that we wanted his torso to turn to camera a little bit as he was delivering the line. And as well, the left arm corrective layer that had only one pose for the left arm has now got keys. So this is where the motion capture uh, stops and the hand key and the animator's craft starts is that 
because this audio wasn't provided before the motion capture shoot, then we had to work with it afterwards. And that's what made that shot really fun to work on. So at that point in time, we decided to enhance the motion capture at that point. So the motion capture was just the base and then we were adding some flavor on top. So here you go. You can see that I've got selected clavicle, the arm, the hand, and then all of those have some keys on them that are not overriding the, the mocap, see, because the mocap is still there, but then it's put on top of it so the character can uh, can do his action. So what's good about that is that at any time you can decide to revert. And if you hide your layer, then the mocap is underneath and you've not altered it nor broken it. So you can always go back and forth, which is pretty pretty practical if you ask me. Same thing, if the timing wasn't right and felt like the arm was moving a bit too early or too late, I can still move those curves on the timeline and make him do the motion later or earlier. And it's easier for me to adjust my timing. If I had done that on the base animation layer, it'd be way more difficult to tweak, considering that everything's connected. Same goes for the torso. So the torso is also moving alongside the the arm so the character delivers his line a bit more towards camera if we disable torso and if we disable arm then we uh, we have what the mocap was pretty much which is really close to what it was in the, the mocap shoot apart of course from the filtering that happened and finally comes the time to polish. So you can see there's a bit more layers in there. There's still a lot of keys onto the base animation. They were filtered and still present. And if I take all of those layers and disable them, I will still have the motion capture underneath if I ever need to return to it. So nothing is destructive, basically. We just keep on adding on top and use the motion capture as a nice noise under. So you see that I've added some uh, keys onto the hair there and then some uh, poses on the cape as well. Those kind of details, even though they are very, very tempting to add as soon as you get the file, it's very important to keep them towards the, like, the very final stages. You don't want to be doing dynamics and simulation and nice secondary motion if your base animation and if your acting is not right. I know it is very tempting to make things nice and pretty straight away at the secondary motion and the overlaps, but those things need to happen step by step to make sure that the process is the most effective possible. Now, there is a caveat I need to put right there, a disclaimer. Basically, you see me using a lot of animation layer because I really love them and I think they're amazing tools when it comes to adding to mocap and not destruct, you know, destroying what the mocap is to start with. But the problem with the animation layers is that if you're not organized and you don't know what layer is doing what, you might enter uh, some dangerous uh, territory where you might be countering things between layers. So let me explain a bit more. If you have a layer with your head and neck, for example, and your character's doing a head turn, for example, and you've added that head turn on top, and then you've got another layer on top that is you know, a corrective layer for the posture, and you put keys on there as well, and then you end up rotating the head back, thinking you're on the the original layer, the one you had the head turn on, you might end up creating countering. So your curves will be going up in one and then going down in the other, and you'll get somewhat of a you know middle ground. And that's where the motion starts being tricky. And that's where you might end up breaking things and blaming it on you know the mocap. Where is this noise coming from? Why is the head wobbling at that point? My layers are not doing that. But if you are not quite organized and you don't know what layers are doing, all the chances are that you have done some of that countering. So when you use um, animation layers, do use them. I encourage you to do it, but be very mindful and be careful of what you put on your animation layers and what they are doing. 
Right, let's move on to this one example right there, which is a really, really cool shot that I had uh, the pleasure to work on. It was very challenging, but very, very cool and rewarding to finish. Um, this is with multiple characters. So we've got four main ones and then we've had, you know, um, two more that were added towards the end uh, for more population and, and polish. So let's dive in. All right, this is the final scene I'm going to show you guys. This is the scene that was used for the Three Kingdoms launch trailer, where Liu Bei gets lifted from the ground by his followers. So this is the raw mocap that we had. So here we go. Those characters are all here in the scene and they all needed a fast pass of posture. So you're starting to know me by now. Everyone had a few layers where they had correction on them. So you go Liu Bei had a layer for his head and neck. He had a layer for his arms uh, with poses or roles. So let's just select that. Here you go, you can see there's some main keys on there just so his arms are better posed. Uh, Guan Yu had some uh, corrective layers as well. One on the spine because his posture wasn't really nice. Uh, then one on the the arms, then one on his head and neck as well. Zhang Fei had a layer as well on his posture and Zhao Yun as well. Here we go. So all of them had a very basic first pass of posture, but now you can see in camera, there's a whole lot of mess here with intersection and uh, yeah, things not being aligned. This is because when we do motion capture, First, we might not have four different actors that could do that. So for this one, for example, we had two actors and they had to play the take multiple times. And then we had to stitch all of those actions to work together. And as well, the proportions of the actors in the suit don't always match the ones of the character in the game. So it's been something quite recurrent with Three Kingdoms, where I think there was something with the length of the torso that was slightly different uh, overall. So yeah, we had to do a lot of fixing on that. So this is the Romo cap with a little bit of uh, corrective layers on top. Now for this cleanup pass, I did even more layers. So you can see that if I select, for example, Zhang Fei, uh, and I go to the base animation layer, you can see that his mocap here is completely still here and not been touched at all. That's because I always try to keep the motion capture intact before I start altering it too drastically. So here we go, let's go in shot. At that point, I just added more finger, finger poses, um, the basic position of the arms, they're not clipping through anymore, and they all have a little bit of uh, facial expressions uh, that just make it a bit, you know, a bit nicer. So Guan Yu, for example, has got some, some expressions. Zhang Fei as well has got some uh, facial expression uh, on there and uh, his eye line as well is separate there and Liu Bei as well because I couldn't stand to have his eyes looking at me <laughs> still looking at me like a yeah like very quite quite creepy quite creepy so here you go first pass of facial animation on him so yeah so that's a quite quite a heavy scene same thing um uh, I try to keep things as clean as possible outside of camera, but for that particular case, you can see that uh, Zhang Fei, for example, is pretty clean. If I look at his posture, I mean, the, the knees are clipping a little bit through the ground, but that's okay. But for Guan Yu, I definitely had to cheat heavily. And so his, his leg is completely under the ground. So in camera, we don't see his leg in the middle and clipping through Liu Bei's arm. As well, in that scene, I did some uh, recoil on Liu Bei's spine. So this is towards the end when he is like this. I just wanted his torso to be, to feel a little bit weightier in that area. Then I moved on to the next stage, which was more second pass and uh, adding flourishes overall. So this character actually made it in as well at that point. So yeah, some more animation on the, the, the face, the head. Those hands are still not constrained and uh, still not attached. So I don't break anything. Uh, if, if things are still meant to move or be changed or altered in terms of timing, I've got all the freedom to move things around. 
But yeah, we've got some extra layers now where I enhance the mocap. So for example, Liu Bei reaches for the sword. So if I select the controllers that are in this layer here, we can see there's some animation on there and that's him lifting his arm and reaching for the sword. So the motion capture under is the same as in previous scenes, but I'm adding extra layers of actions on top. Uh, same thing for uh, Zhang Fei, actually. Zhang Fei is uh, looking at the sword at that point, so I've angled his head down so he can look down at the sword and interact a little bit more with the scene. And same thing for his left arm. I've added some flourish, so prior, prior to that he was just, you know, holding his arm like this to the side, but we thought, you know what, just let's just make him look a bit nicer and have his hand rest onto this uh, water vial thingy on his, <laughs> on his hip. We can uh, add even more layers just to fix things up in terms of posture and in terms of uh, clipping. I know this is a lot of layers, but for that scene, that was the way I chose to organize myself to make sure that I had flexibility all the time and not have to roll back and uh, break anything. So all of this is separate and I can always deactivate all my layers or play with the weight of the layers as well, just so I can add things on top and not do anything destructive to the mocap under. If we look at the mocap under, there are some uh, filtering that happened, but yeah, overall, I kept things as clean as I could because that was a very complex scene. And finally, I moved on to the polishing phase. So that was the most fun part of uh, the project. So yeah, <laughs> Zhuge Liang made his appearance as well in that scene at that point because I needed every character to be able to interact and the eyeline to be correct in the scene. Yeah, you can see that Wen Yu now is doing a different little action on there. He's picking up his, his weapon and doing a, a nice pose here. Uh, looking down and picking up his trusty stuff. And uh, yeah, you can see that, uh, where is he? Gwen your shoulder pad. We should have a different layer as well for this, if I'm not mistaken. Or did I do it on the base animation layer in that case? Yeah, it seems like I did that on a different layer and then chose to bake it so I could clean it up. So yeah, sometimes um, I will do some changes and some uh, tweaking. Yeah, here you go. So he is actually now grabbing the shoulder pad from Liu Bei. So that's one of the last things that I did on that anim is that I made sure that things could interact more and that the motion was clean. So yeah, IK was the way to go there just so I could align and constrain my controllers and make sure that things looked nice in camera. Yeah, it's a lot of layers. I, I know it's a lot of layers, but it's, it's very practical. And uh, yeah, I could work on that scene and remain organized for as long as I did because I had all those layers and that flexibility in there. So to give you an idea of uh, how much motion capture helped me in those cases, so the malice shot with the lip sync and all took roughly one hour to uh, edit the motion capture. So pick the scene that I wanted, crop, retime a few things, uh, put at zero, zero, export and then retarget. So transfer the data into uh, Maya. And then from Maya, all the cleanup, the back and forth with the acting, um, hand keying the motion on him and then <clears throat> making the motion work with the sound and the voice acting. That was roughly eight hours worth of my time. So it's it's in between in terms of time that it would take to do for someone um, um, if it was made from scratch, hand keyed. But uh, for the flexibility that it gives us, we always default to motion capture when it comes to those kind of motions. It just gives us a nice, um, a nice noise under. And then for the Liu Bei trailer uh, with all those characters, so that was a lot of time spent to uh, edit the motion capture. So time all the characters together, line them up, uh, pick the takes because we had multiple takes with the actors doing the same action but for different characters. So we have to time all the all the speed between the characters so things work correctly and then align them and then transfer that into Maya and do a good animation pass on there to sell the weight, uh, add the secondary motion, add the, 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 
the dynamics on the capes, uh, etc., uh, the clipping, all the extra bits of acting, etc. So that was like 90 hours, uh, roughly. I've rounded it up, um, <clears throat> down actually, I rounded it down. So uh, yeah, so that's like a, an indication if you are curious about how much time uh, I spent on those two different shots. Uh, final thoughts about this uh, process because we're coming we're coming to the end of this talk. Uh, mocap is an amazing tool. Like I really love mocap. It speeds up the process of animation a lot, especially when we want to tell stories with like you know ten different characters surrounding one. Like that would take so long to do uh, if you were to do it all from scratch by hand and it would be amazing and a very challenging scene and exciting to work on but because we have budget uh, restrictions you know like we just have a certain amount of budget we can spend on trailers uh, for animation needs and we've got really great ideas in terms of storytelling it is really the, the way to go and it's very nice to work with um, we can do and turn around so much data in such a short amount of time. You've you've seen the character with walking with the torch earlier. He was very simple to do and very simple to enhance, and that was you know all bang for bucks, if I can <laughs> you can I can say this. So yeah, very 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 good uh, tool, and it's extremely flexible. You can record different takes and then blend them together, alter the speed and do all that and very early on you can have a good idea of what your motion is going to look like which is way harder to do when you just do hand key animation mocap is creative T people tend to think that you know mocap can be cheating or you just have to edit it and that's it you know clean it up and that's it but no it is really exciting to work uh, with uh, the planning part is exciting because you get you know to really dig 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 deep into you know what the acting is going to be what the character is going to look like etc taking part in a mocap shoot is extremely fun if you're in the suit it's awesome if you are directing it's really fun as well it's a good uh, creative uh, space as well to alter the motion and the acting so it's really creative on that front as well and once again the quick turnaround you can turn around so many different options with your motion capture so quickly that it is really like extremely creative because you can really rush through ideas and uh, experiment with things and mocap for total war uh, that's like a very very important tool in our workflow for the gameplay side of things for all those characters running around it is a time saver and a life saver really to have mocap for that because having to hand, hand key run cycles for hundreds of different skeletons would be absolutely insane in terms of time being used so motion captures um, speeds up the process and as i said earlier for trailers where we need loads of population and characters walking around and carrying boxes and preparing motion capture is amazing for that because we can have all those crowds there for uh, such a cheap amount of uh, time uh, when it comes to animation instead of doing things from scratch well, yeah, I've seen scale and then the detail, you can still add detail, you know, there's like the, the more uh, ideas you've got and that you can record, the more you can get and, you know, play with the details. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching, for following me on this uh, motion capture explanation journey. I hope you got some nice little nuggets of information from that. And uh, yeah, I will see you around. Thank you.